Okay, we're going to have a time of questions now, and we want to see there are so many questions that it's impossible to answer all of them, but we'll try and answer the most important ones, or which I think are more relevant. See, there are some questions which are personal, and uh, <clears throat> it's better you ask those questions to the elders of your church, or send a question to cfc at cfcindia.com. And we may not be able to cover all, but I'll try to go through the more important ones. <clears throat> okay, here's a question which says, I've been hearing, I'm gonna compress them, the questions. I've been hearing sermons from CFC since a long time, it's enabled me to accumulate a lot of knowledge but I find I'm helpless without the power of the Holy Spirit <clears throat> and I'm defeated. How, do, how should I go forward? You see, when we are defeated, it is an indication we are not living under grace. Always remember Romans 6.14. If you're under grace, sin will not have dominion over you. We are saved by grace. Ephesians 2.8, without works, that is freely. You didn't do a single thing to get your sin forgiven. Jesus forgave it all. But to remain under grace all the time is another thing. I have my, for myself taken Romans 6.14 as a clear statement. I fall into sin only if I'm under, not under grace. If I'm remaining under grace, I cannot fall into sin. It's like saying if I'm remaining under the roof of a building, the rain cannot fall on me. It's when I go outside, I put my hand outside the building, the rain falls, I get wet. But under that roof, the rain cannot fall on me. If I'm under grace, sin cannot rule over me. I will be the master over sin. And 1 Peter 5, 5 says, there is only one reason why I don't get grace, why I don't remain under grace, that is pride. No other reason. God gives his grace to the humble, even if you don't ask for it. That's how to remain under grace all the time. So whenever you sin, ask yourself this question. Where was I proud? Show it to me, Lord, so that I can humble myself. Okay. <clears throat> can an unmarried person in these days live without watching pornography and not involved in masturbation? How can I know? seriously, the seriousness of these sins. It is impossible if you're not converted. It's impossible if you don't live under grace, but it is definitely possible if you live under grace. It doesn't matter which sin it is. 1 John 2, 6 says that if we are Christians, we must walk as Jesus walked. You just got to ask yourself whether Jesus would involve himself in these sins. That is your standard. If you don't take that as your standard, and you take the standard of other Christians around you as your standard, you will continue to live in sin till the end of your life. You have to look at the other backslidden, half-hearted Christians around you and say, I'm not going to be like them. I'm only going to look at Jesus, and anything that Jesus would not do is sin. It's clear. The Bible says that all have sinned, Romans 3.23, and come short of the glory of God. So sin is to come short of the glory of God. That's the definition of sin in Romans 3.23. And Romans 6.14 says, sin will not rule over you. And the glory of God, we read in John 1.14, was seen in Jesus Christ. So putting these verses together, I see that anything that Jesus would not do, or that I cannot do in fellowship, let me put it like this, anything I cannot do in fellowship with Jesus Christ, or holding hands with Jesus Christ. If I cannot do it, it is sin. And I must avoid it. And if it takes me 10 years to overcome it, I must battle it for 10 years. I remember when I prayed to God first for the fullness of the Holy Spirit, and I saw all the confusing doctrines around me, different churches. I said, Lord, I do not want a counterfeit. I don't want some cheap experience that somebody says you got it. I don't care somebody telling me you got it. I want a genuine experience if it takes me 10 years. It took me 16 years after I was born again to really come 
into a genuine fullness of the spirit and overcoming life because no one taught me but if i had heard it at a very young age i could have come much earlier into that life many of you have heard this almost from the beginning of your christian life so you don't have to wait as long as i have waited but you got to be whole hearted god is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him you shall seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart says the lord okay i want to have fellowship with godly brothers and sisters i know in a way that glorifies god but i don't have a new covenant church around me and i want to use whatever opportunity for fellowship i don't know how to do it i'm not as good at communicating with people you don't have to have any ability you have to be whole hearted seek god with all your heart according to jeremiah 29 you read verse 11 to 14 you'll see god is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him and he says those who seek me with all their heart will find me read jeremiah 29 11 onwards and it's impossible that god tells a lie if you have not found him i'll tell you in jesus name you have not sought him with all your heart there are other things in life you're seeking how is it people who seek after money make it they seek it with all their heart seek those who seek pleasure seek it those who seek god will with all their heart will find him i can't taste god's love in my heart even though i have meditated on it read god's word and ask the holy spirit to make it real in you we you know romans 5:5 5:5 says it's the holy spirit who makes god's love real in your heart and seek god with all your heart and say lord i want to be filled with the holy spirit not to convince others but to genuinely experience the fullness of the holy spirit that assures me of god's love and assures me all the time that god is my father that cries out from my heart as it says in romans 6 8:16 abba father it's the holy spirit's work have you experienced a time where you experienced where you feel you feel sometimes have you met people whose wives experience a long season of discouragement when well, the bible says a woman is a weaker vessel and so you have to allow for things you know a woman goes through physical periods in their life where they can have things there that they experience in their body that men don't experience they are weaker vessels but that doesn't mean they don't have to rejoice if they are filled with the holy spirit every man and woman can rejoice in the lord always but we cannot force people into do that and don't try to force somebody else into it be an example the bible never tells us to force people into anything god does not even force people to go to heaven so don't try to force your wife or anybody around you into a life that you may have be an example and be patient and merciful with people around you or in your family who don't seem to come up to that be patient i believe that every circumstance that's testing your patience is something you got to endure say okay everything is by the power of the holy spirit you cannot be patient without the power of the holy spirit okay another question is uh um, concerning patients at home with children yes i believe that children can test our patience again the answer is seeking the power of the holy spirit um another question if someone was converted at a young age and fell away a couple of years later is there still mercy in god's heart for him i'm stuck in hebrew 6 which says that it almost says there's no more repentance but if we read hebrew 6 clearly it says there he cannot come back to re- repentance and the word there is not because but as long as he crucifies a fresh the son of god romans hebrew 6 6 so as long as i'm crucifying the son of god that means continuing in my sin i cannot repentance but if i turn from there there is always repentance god does not want anybody to perish but all men to come to repentance there is no person who has backslidden so much that he cannot come back impossible and people ask this question about what if a person has sinned against the holy spirit by blaspheming him well one evidence of person who has committed that sin would be that he has no desire for repentance at all 
And in my whole life, I think I met only one person like that in whom there didn't seem to be any desire for repentance. He seemed to make a joke of sin and he was not really converted. But a person who is really born again and converted, I don't believe he can sin against the Holy Spirit in such a way that he cannot, be, cannot repent. He may backslide, he may lose his salvation, but he will not come to the point where he cannot be forgiven or he cannot repent. So don't ever let anybody tell you that you committed the sin against the Holy Spirit. Because then you would not even have any, any desire to listen to me. You would not have any desire to ask a question. You would not have any desire to repent. If there's the slightest desire in you to turn towards God, that desire is put by the Holy Spirit. You have not sinned against the Holy Spirit. Okay, how do you correct little children with love without using the rod? But... Uh, in anger. We must never correct with anger. I used to, in my younger days, I did not have victory over anger. <clears throat> and whenever I corrected my children in anger, I would always, after punishing them, lock myself in the toilet or restroom <clears throat> and weep before God every single time and say, Lord, <clears throat> teach me how to discipline my children without anger. And finally a time came when I could do it. But every time I did it, I kept on repenting and saying, Lord, this is wrong. The discipline is right. The anger is wrong. Please help me. I believe that God saw my eagerness and earnestness as I kept on praying and seeking God in tears. And God heard it. You do that. I believe it may take time. It took me some years, but I finally came there. And if you really see God, you'll be able to discipline your children without anger, but with patience. Uh, when you see your family members not gripped with a church, and it's a struggle to get them to participate in the church, I'll tell you, be an example and keep praying for them, that's all. I have been, I've tried my best to be a part of a church in my locality, but I'm discouraged because there are practices which I don't believe in. Well, then you must pray that God will bring you in touch with at least one believer in your entire town who is seeking after God. That's how I started, and that's how many people start in many parts in India and other places. They look for one person who's got the same desire to seek after God, like you. And God will bring you in touch with them. And if that doesn't happen for a long time, then in these days you take advantage of watching messages on YouTube, online, and participating in CFC church services, which are online, and that's the next best. And it's an amazing provision that God has made in our generation for that. So make use of that. Another question is, I have a desire for the Lord, but I can't read and pray for more than 15 minutes. Well, you, if you can't read and pray for more than 15 minutes, read for as much as you can. But more important than that is meditate on what you have read. If you, one verse spoke to you, and if you find difficult to concentrate, write it on a piece of paper and keep it with you. And during the day, at different times, take it out and meditate on that. The important thing is not just to read, to meditate on the word of God. And the Bible says in Psalm 1 that if you meditate on God's word and turn away from sin, as far as you know it, whatever you do will prosper. It is God's will that you should grow. Another question is, during these times of lockdown, I've tried to be more alert. But I'm alone and I find myself spending a lot of time in social media and visiting filthy websites, and I'm drifting away from purity. Do you think that you were pure when there was no lockdown? No. You were just as filthy then. The only thing is you didn't get opportunity for it to come out. It was locked up inside. Whether you have filth inside your heart or whether it manifests itself outside, it's just the same. It's just the same. It's like an unflushed toilet. It's just filth. If you close the door, it's still not flushed. It's filthy. It was there, this filth, this unflushed toilet inside your heart. 
and you've got to acknowledge it. It's there, Lord. Please cleanse me within. It's manifesting itself in these times of lockdown when I'm all by myself. But it was always there. Thank you for these lockdown times where I discovered the filth that was in my heart. The unflushed toilet bowl that is in my heart helped me to get rid of it and cleanse it. The power of the Holy Spirit to be clean in my heart. I believe the answer is to live before God's face. Perhaps you've been living too much before man's face where you wanted to appear good before people. And from now on, say, Lord, when a bad thought comes into my mind, I want to repent and confess it to you. When a bad attitude towards someone comes into my mind, I want to repent and confess it to you. When a bad motive I discover in something good I did, I want to repent. If you're very careful with the inner life, recognizing man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart, I believe you'll come into victory very soon. Your inner life will correspond with your outer life. Everything depends on wholeheartedness. God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. He does not reward half-hearted people. And I've seen a number of people in my life, not many, whom God has rewarded in an amazing way, filled them with the Holy Spirit. They were wholehearted, radical. And I've seen numerous people who sit even in CFC churches who are half-hearted. They never come into a life of victory. They have an outward form of godliness, but they don't have the power. That can happen even if you sit in the best church in the world. Seek God with all your heart and God has to break his word in Jeremiah 29 if he doesn't meet with you, if you sought him with all your heart. He will not break his word. He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Hebrews 11.6. Think of these verses. Every person who has sought God wholeheartedly in the history of the Christian church has found him. And if somebody did not find him, he has to say to himself, the fault is not with God. He keeps his word. You say to yourself, I have not been wholehearted. That's all. Okay. Another question is, in the light of Jesus' encouragement to his disciples to fast, how do you encourage someone who has medical conditions, such as a stomach ulcer, to fulfill this command? See, God understands. If God has not healed you of your stomach ulcer and medical uh, doctors say it's better not to fast, then don't. Or Eat limited quantities. Fasting is not necessarily completely avoiding food. We read in the book of Daniel that he took a limited fast. You can fast by avoiding certain foods you, you like. You can still eat. But fasting is of different forms. And take a limited fast if you feel God's leading you to fast. But don't talk about it. And don't think that fasting will bring you to victory. It's wholeheartedness that brings you to victory. Not necessarily fasting. Okay. Uh, what is the confirmation that one is filled with the Holy Spirit? I personally believe it is the fact that you, you know, let's ask ourselves this question. How do you know a person's got an unclean spirit? He's unclean. How do you know a person's got an evil spirit? He's evil. How do you know he's got the Holy Spirit? He's holy. So unfortunately, a lot of people have diverted the definition, the mark of the fullness of the Holy Spirit is speaking in tongues. There's not a single verse in the Bible that teaches that. And let me teach you something about studying the Bible. Never get a doctrine from the historical sections of Scripture. They are edifying to read and meditate on. But if you want to get a doctrine in the New Testament, go to the teaching sections of Scripture. The teachings of Jesus the teachings in the epistles, but not the history of what Jesus did and not the history of what the apostles did. So if you go to the Acts of the Apostles to get a doctrine, blame yourself if you went astray. That is given for our edification. It says in one place in the Acts of the Apostles that they all spoke in tongues, Acts chapter 2. But that's not a doctrine. It's a historical fact. A lot of people take that, but the people who take that don't take, that's Acts 2.4, but they don't take what's written in Acts 2.44, that they shared everything they had in common. These people who speak in tongues, do they give up all their money and share it with others? No, they select certain things which they like and ignore other things which they don't like. That is dishonesty. 
and such dishonest people deserve to be deceived. Don't take a doctrine from the historical sections of scripture. Paul circumcised Timothy, Acts 16. It's not a doctrine. Paul shaved his head, you read in Acts chapter 21. That's not a doctrine. In the epistles, you get doctrine. Same way with the gospels. Jesus healed everybody. That's not a doctrine. That's a historical fact. And Jesus opened blind eyes. That's not a doctrine. That's a historical fact. Go to the teachings of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount and other teachings if you want to know doctrine. So very often, people, all scripture is profitable for understanding, for leading a person to righteousness. But you need to decide what is the doctrines we preach in the church. Okay. Uh, so being filled with the Holy Spirit, this is a question was that. I believe it is by being holy in Romans 5.5, 5, if there is a verse that talks about the fullness of the Holy Spirit, your heart is filled with love for Jesus and love for others. I'm still concerned, condemned by my past sins, even after water baptism, and still have dirty dreams. Now, dirty dreams are not the same as dirty thoughts. They are unconscious sin. You don't have to be condemned about dirty dreams. You get dirty dreams because you have had, had a lifetime of thinking dirty thoughts. And it'll take a long time for those dirty dreams to go. And I'll tell you how they can go. Think of this illustration. Here, your, your mind is like a bowl of water. And you put a lot of mud in, into that bowl of water through the years, dirty stuff. And so that bowl is absolutely filthy. And from that dirty bowl, you get dreams. Now, if you pour clean water into that bowl, that bowl is full of dirty water right now. You pour clean water, which is the word of God. You keep on pouring God's word into it. Gradually, that dirty water gets dilute and dilute. It's an only an illustration. Don't stretch it too far. It gets dilute and dilute and overflows and overflows. And hey, after a while, it's not as dirty as it was before. And you keep on doing that. And a time will come when it's pure water there. So the solution is to fill your mind with God's word and meditate on it, meditate on it, till it goes deep down into your mind. I spent the first seven years of my life after I was born again and baptized, meditating on God's word. Once I got married, it was more difficult to spend time. Those of you who are single, you have plenty of opportunity to study God's word. Instead of wasting your time, you know, going on the internet and seeing a lot of things which don't help you, why not read God's word? Meditate on it. Listen to good messages, messages that lead you to God's word. Go through the book, through the Bible. And meditate on God's word as, it, as that book leads you to the Bible. And thus you can fill your mind with things that will gradually, slowly, maybe over 25 years, your dirty dreams will go. But it will never go if you don't keep on filling your mind with God's word. But we have to be convicted about dirty thoughts because that's conscious sin. Dirty dreams are unconscious sin. But dirty dreams are the result of having indulged in dirty thoughts for years. Okay. Is it possible to become too familiar with our children, to joke around with them and be humorous? I don't think so. Will they lose respect for us? No. I don't think fathers should be too serious with their children. Yeah, we must teach them principles of God's word. But I believe that humor is a very good way by which we build a relationship with our children, with our wives, and with other people. A person who does not ever joke with his wife, I say he has got a bad relationship with his wife, something wrong. Because humor is the test of a good relationship. You know, you can think of a relationship with a person whom you never joke with, you can, who, whom you've got attention with in your church. You can read the Bible with him. You can go to church with him. You can pray with him, but you will not, never joke with him. Think when you have attention with your wife, something happened and there's a tension. You will still be able to read the Bible in the morning with her pray with her, but you'll never joke with her. We joke with people with whom we have a, I mean clean jokes I'm talking about, with whom we have a good relationship. Humor is a gift of God by which we test, I believe, we test our relationship with the person. Is it a good relationship or a bad one? So it's very good to use humor with our children. So 
though we must make sure that it is not something that is moves into the realm of anything that hurts other people don't joke in a way that hurts other people speaking evil of other people or joking about other people joke about yourself tell your children about some stupid foolish thing you did in your younger days which you have repented of i don't mean sinful things don't give any details but something which is not sinful another question is what if i and my wife have different convictions on something and one is more strict about certain things and one is not so strict in matters which are not sinful lawful but not profitable we must remember in human relationships whether it's you and a brother in the church or you and your wife or you and your husband everybody is not at the same spiritual level so don't force that person to live at your level example here are two boys in a family one is in the 10th standard and other is the 3rd standard the 10th standard boy cannot expect his younger brother who's in 3rd standard to know all that he knows he's got to bear with him in the same way you may be in the 10th standard spiritually or 10th grade and your wife may be in the 3rd grade be merciful she doesn't know everything that you know of what is sin and what is not sin something that you see clearly as sin because you're in 10th grade your wife may not see because she's in the 3rd grade or vice versa maybe you as a wife you're in the 10th grade and your husband is still in the 3rd grade spiritually in terms of sin it's not a knowledge of the bible it's a knowledge of sin that determines our spiritual maturity bear with your husband then don't despise him you also were once in the 3rd grade don't despise anybody who's in a lower grade but be merciful and don't look down on such people love the person jesus never looked down even on a woman caught in adultery so that is how we help people to grow not by forcing our convictions on them okay there is another question about i feel i've been called to serve god but i got to spend my life i lost my job last week just because you lost your job doesn't mean you're called to serve god the calling to serve god is a unique calling and it must be confirmed by other godly men around you god called me to his service on the 4th and the 6th of may 1964 which is 56 years ago but it was confirmed almost immediately by a godly servant of god the same day that's how i knew god had called me and he never knew anything about god calling me i didn't ask him he came up to me so i see that in the same thing you read in acts 13 when god called saul and barnabas to god and served him it was confirmed by other godly people around them so if you think you're called to serve god and other godly people around you have not confirmed it you are not called to serve god go and find another job if you lost one don't say there are many people like that in india unfortunately they lost their job and they say i think god's called me to serve them they didn't do well in school couldn't get admission in college so they say i think i'll go to a bible college and serve god i'm sorry to say more than 90% of people in christian work today in, in india went into christian work because they didn't find any other job they were not good in their academics and uh, if they really were good in their academics they'd have probably gone to college and got a good profession that's a pathetic testimony why should those who fail in every subject go and serve the lord i believe peter and john were first class fishermen and james and all of them and matthew was a top class accountant those are the people whom god called those who were faithful in their earthly job so if you're not faithful in whatever you are in an earthly job no matter what level of your intelligence is god will not call you to his service it's a unique thing to be called by god and even if you are called by god try your best to serve him like paul did supporting yourself financially as i have done all these years all these years that cfc has existed more than 40 years that's the best way to serve god okay i sometimes hear the word mystic or mysticism and uh, relating to some old saints but some of these people were monks who spent all their time in monasteries we don't use that word too much i don't find it in the bible the the bible speaks about devotion to jesus christ and you don't have to live in a monastery so you live an ordinary life as a married man and a family man and you can be devoted to christ 
that devotion to Christ is what the Bible speaks about, and that's what we should concentrate on. Uh, which Bible should I use? You use the NASB, but I use the New King James Version. You can use the only version which I am not too happy with is the New International Version, NIV, because 1 Peter 4 verse 1 has not at all been translated correctly. 1 Peter 4 verse 1 is a verse that talks about victory over sin, about finishing with sin, and that version gives an interpretation. It's a commentary and not a translation. So maybe other verses in NIV are okay, but that one verse is enough for me to reject the whole version. But you can use mostly any other version. The old King James Version, the English is bad. That's why I don't use it. Because Not bad, but it's ancient English. Okay. Uh, here's another question is, supposing I pass along good articles and sermons to my relatives and there's no response, should I keep doing it? Always pass out things with prayer. And don't trust it on people. If there's no response, just leave it. Another question is about Pentecostals. I was raised in a Pentecostal church, this question, our questioner says, and they taught me about humility and seeking God, and they asked God for the Holy Spirit gifts to serve. And I've heard Brother Zach in a couple of sermons talk bad about Pentecostals. It would be beneficial for Zach to say what he's condemning about specific denominations. Well, I believe the main reason where I disagree with, I believe that are God-fearing, God-fearing people in Pentecostal churches I've met. For that matter, I've met God-fearing people in the Roman Catholic Church. I think Mother Teresa was a very godly woman, even though her doctrines were wrong. She'll have a higher place in heaven than me, because God looks at the heart and not the mind, how the mind has understood doctrines. So, but in the Pentecostal Church and in the Roman Catholic Church, there are people who are not godly, or their doctrines are wrong. I think the doctrines of many Pentecostals that if you, if you speak in tongues, then only you're filled with the Spirit is 100% wrong because I don't find it anywhere in the teaching sections of Scripture. In the teaching sections of Scripture, 1 Corinthians 12, it says very clearly, it's a gift given to some. Some are apostles, some are prophets, some speak in tongues. But they've completely violated that. And that's why I disagree with them and they've led, led a lot of people astray. And they don't seem to emphasize a holy life. They speak about being filled with the Holy Spirit, but they don't emphasize holiness. And if you belong to a church that emphasizes holiness and walking as Jesus walked and taking up the cross every day and does not force people to speak in tongues or say that is the only mark of being filled with the Spirit, then yours is a good church. You keep going there. Another question is, uh, it seems there are instances of revivals in the Bible. A lot of serious Christians I've heard talk about revivals. Isn't that something we should pray for? I think it's a question of what do you understand by revival. Many people think revival is many people accepting Christ in an evangelistic meeting or church suddenly getting hundreds of people joining it. What's use all these people joining the church if they're not interested in becoming disciples? Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations. So I'd rather make 10 disciples than 1,000 people who want to go to heaven. I mean, if I look at India, 1,200 million people, everybody wants to go to heaven. Have you ever met a person who doesn't want to go to heaven? So if a person wants to go to heaven, that doesn't mean he's interested in salvation from sin. It may be 1% of born-again believers who I find are serious about overcoming sin. Those are the people I want to work with. And if, a, if I find people coming to a life of wanting to overcome sin, that's revival for me. It's an inward revival in people. And if I get 11 people like the disciples of Jesus, that's revival. What crowd did Jesus have? Did Jesus have revivals in his ministry? What were the revivals? Thousands of people listening to him? No. The fact that he got 11 people who turned the world upside down and started something that's lasted for 2,000 years. That's revival. Disciples, making disciples. So that's my understanding of revival. And... Uh, there are questions concerning married life. I believe very often in married life, the important thing to learn, whether with wife or husband or children, is patience. We are such impatient people that we want everybody around us to change immediately. It does not happen. God is trying to teach you patience through your husband, through your wife, through your children. Learn it. 
And as they see your patience, that you don't get irritated and you don't get angry, and you're patient and long suffering in the way you are willing to bear with them as they don't seem to agree with everything you do, gradually they will come to a godly life. But if you're impatient, don't expect them to come to godliness. Okay. Uh, I have a passion for computer programming and I don't like people without good skills in my office going up the ladder. That means your passion is not for computer programming. Your passion is for going up the ladder and becoming a more important person in your office or earning more money or becoming a bigger person in the office. Make sure that your, your first passion should be to follow Jesus. And your earthly job is only a means of earning a living. But the world is an unjust place. And so accept the fact that people will do something wrong and go up the ladder. But that's not what you live for. You say, Lord, help me to earn my living, not to become the most important person in my office. Your motives are wrong. Your pursuit is wrong. Get rid of that and you'll be happy. Now in the Old Testament, in Deuteronomy 30, the Lord says, I, what I'm commanding you is not too difficult for you beyond, or beyond your reach. Yes, the Ten Commandments, so the things which Jesus, with the Lord commanded Moses, for example, you go through the Ten Commandments. The only thing that was difficult to keep in that Ten Commandments was the tenth one. You shall not desire, you shall not covet. And God left that there to test how many people would be serious about godliness. The other nine commandments, you know, don't worship idols and don't take the name of the Lord in vain and all the other things, anybody can keep. And there was a rich young ruler who came to Jesus and said, I kept it all. The apostle Paul said, I kept it all, except the tenth one. So all those were commandments, even the laws in Leviticus and Numbers, they could all be kept. So it was not difficult to keep. But God kept one commandment there, the tenth one, to test people. How many will be honest and say, oh, I can't keep the tenth commandment. Those are the ones like Paul, whom God led to a victorious life. So in the new covenant, the wonderful thing is we can keep the tenth commandment. You read Romans chapter 7 and chapter 8. That's what he's essentially saying there. I could not keep the 10th commandment, but now by the Holy Spirit, I can walk in the Spirit and keep it. Okay, another question is, is it wrong if I commit a sin and then go to church? Am I a hypocrite? No. If you commit a sin and you don't repent of it, then you're a hypocrite. It's not a question of whether you go to church or not. Um, if God's gift of salvation is a free gift, cannot be earned by good works, why are works needed to be stay saved? Well, when it says in Ephesians 2.8, by grace are you saved, not a works, he's talking about being saved from the penalty of sin. There are three tenses in salvation. Past, present, future. Past is uh, deliverance from the penalty, the punishment for sin. That happens in a moment, and you can never do it by works. Ten million good works cannot forgive one sin. You know that. Only the blood of Jesus can do that. But then there's salvation in the present tense. Salvation from the penalty of sin, only the blood of Jesus Christ, no good works. Now, second, we come to salvation from the power of sin. Thirdly, salvation from the presence of sin. Salvation from the presence of sin is future. When Christ comes again, we'll completely be freed. But now, salvation from the power of sin, that is by grace. And it's that salvation from the power of sin that proves that you're walking with the Lord. And that proves that you're really repented and you're progressing. Not stuck in the same place, because if you're stuck in the same place, you'll go down. You know, an aircraft in the sky has to keep moving to stay in the air. The moment it stops, it drops. So in your Christian life also, if you're not moving forward in the Christian life, you switched off the engines, you'll drop. You can't stay like a helicopter up there in the sky. Any plane that switches off its engines just drops. So we've got to make progress. It's just an illustration. If you're not making progress, you drop and you can lose your salvation. Romans, uh, Revelation 3, 5 says, if you overcome, your name will not be erased from the book of life. 
Hebrews 3.14 says, we are made partakers of Christ if we persevere until the end. So that is why we say, not do works to stay saved. No. Faith without works is dead. The works are the proof that my faith is genuine. So don't mix up these two. Are there any men's writings that have been a blessing to you? Yes. From my earliest days, I've read the writings of many godly people. I never found a commentary that was not academic. Almost every commentary was academic, Bible commentary. So I never read any of them. But there were individual godly books that I read. Any book that spoke to my heart and not to my head, I would read if it challenged me to a godly life. Not a book that merely said, those Christians are bad, those Christians are bad. That's all true. Jesus also said that. He criticized the Pharisees and exposed their errors. We need a little bit of that in our life too. But Jesus didn't spend all his time exposing the Pharisees alone. He taught godliness. So I look for books that lead me to godliness. So any book that leads you to godliness, you must be willing to read. Okay, another question is, I'm not sure still about God's plan for my life. I don't know what field he wants to use me. Are there things to ascertain his will? There's a book of mine called Finding God's Will, which you can get from the internet, cfcindia.com, or which you can even order from there. And there are many answers given to that question. Another question is, how do I give more to God? Well, uh, God loves a cheerful giver. So start with cheerfulness. If you can give only a small amount cheerfully, give. And if you can't give anything cheerfully, don't give. But don't ever give grudgingly. And that is how you learn to give to God. He's not looking at how much you give. He's looking at how cheerful you are and whether you feel grateful. The most important thing God wants from you, first of all, is not your money. Many people think, what shall I give to God? Well, read Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. In view of God's tremendous mercies to you. What should you give to God? Not money. Romans 12, verse 1 and 2 says, first your body, every part of your body. Say, Lord, use my tongue, my eyes, my hand, only to glorify you. That's what you got to give first. And then your mind, Romans 12, 2. Read God's word and let your mind be conformed to the mind of Christ. That is what we have to give. Very often people think only of money. No. We have to give our body and our mind. Okay. Uh, another question is concerning what is the difference between faith and 1 Timothy 1 5, sincere faith? Well, I believe faith should be sincere faith. Sincere means genuine. There's counterfeit faith and genuine faith. Faith without works is counterfeit. That's not sincere. It's hypocritical. It's a head faith. It's just knowledge of facts. Like God is a trinity. Jesus died for the sins of the world. Even the devil believes that. That's not faith. That's just a knowledge of certain facts, which some people think is faith. Christians believe certain truths, which non-Christians don't believe. That doesn't mean they've got faith. They understand the truth. They believe 2 plus 2 is 4. Somebody else says 2 plus 2 is 5. That's not faith. It's just knowing certain facts, which are true. But faith is a dependence upon God. It's trusting God, like I said earlier in the session. So that is sincere faith. And the question is also, it says here, we should not think of ourselves ourself more highly than we should, that according to the measure of faith God has given us. I think of men like George Muller, who had more faith than the average Christian. Can a Christian fool himself to think that he's got a high level of faith? See, the Bible speaks about the grace of faith and the gift of faith. Faith is a gift in 1 Corinthians 12, just like the gift of prophecy, the gift of healing, the gift of speaking in tongues. Faith is also a gift. It's mentioned there. That is the gift that George Muller had. He had a gift of faith to take care of 2,000 orphans. 
Now, you and I may not have that gift of faith, but we can have the grace of faith, which enables us to trust God's promises, to overcome sin. Sin shall not rule over you. And to love people, love your enemies, to bless those that curse you. We can have faith for that, to obey God's commandments. That is the faith which we need to have. The other is for ministry. We must distinguish between life and ministry. There is a faith for life and a faith for ministry. Not everybody is called for full-time Christian work. When I left my job 56 years, 54 years ago, two years after I was called early, the Navy released me. I, God gave me the gift of faith. But I don't ask other people to leave their jobs because God may not give them that gift of faith. They should earn their living in a secular job. So there's a difference between faith for ministry and faith for your overcoming in your daily life. And another question is regarding women not being allowed to teach. That's in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12. That's the Holy Spirit saying that a woman should not teach. They can prophesy means they can share something that will encourage and bless others. Uh, but they cannot teach because God has not given them that, uh, that gift. You never, God, Jesus never chose an apostle who was a woman. There were so many women who followed Jesus. Martha and Mary and Bethany and Mary Magdalene was the first person to see the resurrected Christ. And many others like that. But not one of them did he call to be an apostle. Not one of them did he give authority. In the Old Testament, there were prophetesses like Huldah in Jeremiah's time. Anna, the prophetess you read of in Luke chapter 2. But after the day of Pentecost, you never read of a woman prophetess. Only the false prophetess, Jezebel. So there's a difference between prophet and prophesying. Prophesying is to speak to people, to encourage them, and to challenge them. And even a woman can do that. A man can do that. A woman can bless so many sisters by sharing God's word with them. That is the spirit of prophecy, not telling, foretelling the future, which even a man is not called to do. It's Old Testament prophecy is different from New Testament prophecy. But teaching is a gift God gives only to men. That doesn't mean to teach men. A woman should not teach men. But a woman can teach other women. A woman can teach little children at the measure of her level, but she must be under the authority of a man who is her elder, her husband, or an elder in a local church. There are many godly missionaries who've gone out into unreached areas and preached the gospel and taught about Christ to unconverted people. And God used them mightily. So we need to understand that in a local church, leadership and teaching is given to men. Okay. Another question is concerning um, should we judge people who they, somebody says somebody's got a deceiving spirit? Well, leave that to mature godly elders to take that decision. Who's got a deceiving spirit and all? Don't move into realms where God has not gifted you. Oh, this is a personal question. Brother Zach, with all that the God has done through you, how have you been able to remain humble and approachable? Well, I want to be as humble as Jesus Christ, but I've not reached there yet. I'm pressing on. But I believe it's a goal that all of us should work towards. And the only way to get there is by meditating and looking at the life of Jesus all the time. Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, learn from me for I am humble. He never told us to learn how to preach or sing or anything. So many Christians spend hours learning how to preach and how to sing. Why not learn how to be humble from Jesus Christ? Look at the life of Jesus. See how he washed people's feet and see how I said earlier in my last session, how he never took a place which exalted him over others. He was willing to be despised and rejected. Learn humility from Jesus Christ. He was willing to mingle with sinners and he, he, could, he could be approached by anyone. We read that Nicodemus came to him in the middle of the night and Jesus opened the door and talked to him. Now I realize that sometimes if your ministry expands to such a place where you don't have time to meet 1,000 people who want to talk to you, 
Well, God understands that. There were great multitudes that came around Jesus Christ. I'm sure all of them would like to talk to him, but he would sometimes go away with the 12 and be alone because he knew that he couldn't spend his time counseling 1,000 or 5,000 people. He could bless them with a message, but then he had to move away because he was training people for the future. So we have to recognize that a servant of God may not always have time to meet everyone who wants to talk to him. But usually a servant of God who is with churches will have a team of people who will be a help to others. But the answer to all humility is to look at Jesus and follow his example. It is impossible for anyone to be proud who is looking at Jesus and not looking at his own accomplishments. We must never look at our accomplishments. Your acceptance before God has got nothing to do with your accomplishments in your ministry. It's got to do with having a clear conscience. And God gives grace to the humble. So if you're crazy after getting grace from God, you will pursue humility looking at Jesus. Okay, another question is, if I live in an area where every church I know is preaching something wrong, what should I do? Should I lower my standard and join one of those other churches? No. You should not lower your standard. No. You must be willing to uh, live alone with the Lord and, as I said, listen to messages. You seek fellowship and pray. Even if you're going to, there's no wholehearted church in the area. Pray like this. Lord, lead me to one person who's seeking a godly life. And if you may, you'll never know what will happen. Maybe he'll lead you to one and then another. And gradually, a local church may come up there. Uh, Jesus said, you know, this question has already been answered. It was already asked earlier. What if I was not really converted when I was baptized in water, but I was converted later on, really? Well, then you must be baptized, not again, but for the first time, because you cannot be baptized before you are converted. That is just like child baptism, even if you are an adult. Yeah, this is concerning being in a place where there are no real churches. I'm very poor at making decisions, and I'm a lot confused and tossed about. And so I um, get very anxious. How to come out of this indecisiveness? You need fellowship. If you seek for fellowship with others, I believe that God will be able to help you to find a firmness in your decisions. See, very often people want to follow the Lord all by themselves. That's not God's way. No. Don't seek to follow the Lord all by yourself. Seek for fellowship with at least one other person. Okay. And that number can increase. Do you still go through difficult trials today where you're tempted to, to doubt God? You feel, um, can you share your testimony? Well, <clears throat> I don't believe that we'll ever come to a place where we are not tempted. I look at the example of Jesus again. At the age of 30, having overcome so many temptations in his life, he was still tempted by the devil. At the age of 30, and he was tempted for 40 days. And then a final three temptations. So I don't believe we will ever come to a place in our life where we say, well, I'm not going to be tempted anymore. That just is not going to happen. We will continue to be tempted till the end of our life. And trials, you don't really become perfect without trials. But the trials will be of different types. So... I've had many trials in my life, different types in the past, and I'll continue to have them. But temptation to doubt God becomes less and less and less and less. You know, there's a song we sing, His love in time past forbids me to think that he will leave me at last in trouble to sink. No. 
I've got to look back in my past life and say, look at the things God took me through. Amazing trials. <laughs> He'll take me through this too. So the temptation to doubt God becomes less and less and less and less and less as we go on. And uh, it becomes very, very little. You almost never doubt. You have a confidence in God. God is my father. And if you live in walking with God, if you begin your day with God as your father and talk to him, that's the way you become strong to face the day. Seek to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Keep your conscience clear. How can I have the faith with Jesus marvel? You know, that comes little by little, not all of a sudden. Uh, how do you meet, how did you meet in your life all your many obligations you had at home, the needs of your wife and children, and then now all the fellowships throughout the world? How do you remain at rest in your mind? Well, you know, God does not allow us to be tested beyond our ability. And if God had uh, made me face some of the things I face today, 10 years ago, I'd have been at unrest or 20 years ago. But I, like I said, you go from second grade to third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade. You never get an examination in any grade or standard that's above your ability. The question paper you will get in a final examination in third standard or third grade is a third standard, third grade question paper. When you get to 10th grade or 10th standard, you get a 10th standard question paper. So you can be at rest. You can get 100% in 3rd standard and 100% at 10th standard, but seven years later. So God does not allow you to be tested beyond your ability. That's why we can be at rest, because God is faithful. Okay. Um, can the devil infiltrate our dreams? No. He cannot come into your thoughts. He cannot read your thoughts. But your dreams are the result of what you yourself have thought through many years. How to deal with cultural difference in a CSC church? Well, we must be willing to follow Jesus who, who said there's no difference between Greek and Gentile and Jew and Gentile and anyone. Uh, no difference between high and low. No difference between the slave and the educated person and we must see that Jesus accepts everyone and we must also be willing to accept everyone and in many churches they don't do that they go after the rich they go after the people at a high level of society well we must not follow their example um, there I have covered all the important questions there were some personal questions there which related to personal family life. It's better you ask your elders or someone about that. Or as I said, write to cfc at cfcindia.com and God can help you there. Okay, I think we will close now and let's bow in prayer. Heavenly Father, there could still be many questions in the minds of many, or even some of the answers I gave are not clear enough. I'm a limited human being. And I believe your Holy Spirit can make things much clearer for those who seek you. And it's good that these people who have asked questions don't lean upon a man. A man can only help them so far and no further. And if it has left them a little bit in suspense, it's good a little bit in doubt, it's good because it will lead them to you and that's what I wanted. We are only signposts to point to Christ. I pray that wherever a person did not get a full answer, they will turn to you and get closer to you and get the answer from you through the Holy Spirit. Help us, Lord, to walk with you every day and even if we don't have the answers to all the questions, that we'll walk with a clear conscience, seek to be filled with the Holy Spirit and to be a witness as a burning, shining light for you in this generation. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.